Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the No Line Podcast. I'm Philip Beer, and today's guest is Professor Jay Zagorski at the Questrom School of Business at Boston University. Jay, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. So wonderful to be on your show, Philip. And it's going to be an interesting topic. Uh, I just want to preface our the interview today that uh, there is a push in gaming to move toward cashless and in fact, use cashless as an instrument toward responsible gaming. But today we're discussing a different point of view, which is you are bringing up the point that there's a benefit to using cash in feeling some friction around the gambling experience. That's correct, Philip. And my Let's goal dive is- in. Let's dive in. And I think for the proponents to cashless and the proponent, proponents to cashless and how it relates to responsible gaming. Uh, this is an interesting discussion because I think it's for consideration how cash friction, pain points, in a way can be beneficial toward responsible gambling. Yeah, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to merge the idea of cashless and responsible gambling. And Philip, here in the United States in 2018, the Supreme Court allowed online gambling. They basically said it's legal. And right now, about two thirds of all states have created online gambling ability, or at least gambling in a casino. And the industry has taken off dramatically. In uh, 2018, you could just bet on sports in Nevada. And today, in January 2023, you can bet, as I just said, in about two thirds of all states with more states coming online. And the amount bet has gone up dramatically. How dramatically? Just before the show, I was looking at some of the statistics for New York. In June, which is the latest figures we have, uh, right now it's August for those of you watching on tape, $1.1 billion was bet on sports in just the state of New York. That's in just one month. And that's not even the peak, Philip, because during March madness, during March and April, people were betting around $1.5 billion a month. Now there's only 20 million people in the state of New York. And what does that mean? That people are betting somewhere around $700 per man, woman, and child each year in just New York alone, California, Texas, uh, Florida, then in New York. So we're seeing a tremendous increase in gambling. Now, your show is called Responsible Gambling. And the idea of responsible gambling is that people have some self-control issues. And because they have self-control issues, there need to be guidelines, fence posts, to prevent people from sort of creaming off the road. Because gambling can be addictive, not for everyone, but for some people. Jay, you mentioned um, just in one month, was it 1.5 billion in New York? 1.1 billion was bet that was 1. The 1. Billion, just in one month. So just in the June and the take, the revenue from the online companies, uh, primarily online companies in New York was a hundred million dollars of which the state split 50 50 with the companies. So the, the tax rate basically in New York is a 50%. Um, and that so, is just so Jay, a tremendous amount. What's wrong with that? I mean, it fills the economy. It gives people jobs. I'm, I'm just playing advocate here. Uh, devil's advocate. Yeah. Uh, what's wrong with that? So Philip, we don't have to go into all the research, but for a small percentage of gamblers, gambling can be extremely addictive destroys marriages, destroys savings, right? Causes people to do things that they shouldn't do, stealing from their business, stealing from their friends and family and things like that. So for some people, gambling is just a rush that they need to continue to participate in. And like doing other things that people have self-control issues can end up as a train wreck for certain individuals and certain families. Now, I'm not saying we should ban gambling in any way, shape or form, but it's pretty simple. Before the Supreme Court allowed legal sports betting in states across the country, there were frictions. If you wanted to bet 20 years ago here where I am in Boston, Massachusetts, you need to find a bookie. 
after you found a bookie, you had to go bring cash to that bookie to sort of create your account because the bookie was like, who are you? I'm not going to give you credit. All right. So after you found this bookie, which was illegal, after you gave them cash, then let me tell you what I've seen. Um, people would have to call up and find out the current line because just because you could read on the internet or you could see in the newspaper what the rough line was for a game, you didn't know what that bookie was giving. So maybe the line was you know six points, but the bookie was giving you five or seven or something like that because bookies weren't all instantaneous. So you called up, you had to make some decisions and you called the bookie back, you placed your bet. Very slow, very hard system. If you won, Maybe you drove over to the bookie, picked up some cash. If you lost, you might have to refill your account again. So you had to drive over to the bookie again or walk over to the bookie, pay some cash. A very slow society, a lot, a lot of frictions. Let's imagine today. Today, you pick up your phone. Instantly, you can see propositions. You can see betting lines, things like that. You like something, you go tap, 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 gone. You've just made the bet. Almost no friction. You could be sitting there watching a game and making a bet in line instantaneously. Now, the advantage of frictions is that frictions slow things down by the very nature. And by slowing things down, it can reduce the amount of gambling and give people a moment to think. When people don't think, that's when problems happen. So the idea is putting some friction back in the system so that people can still bet. But when they're betting, they're having an opportunity to take a breath, to think about what they're doing. Instead of just pulling out their phone going, ah, let me bet on this outcome for the next. Is that free throw going to be made in basketball? Yes. No. Bet, bet, bet. <laughs> right? And at the end of the game, you look down and you're like, wow, how did I get in such a hole? Because you were just caught up in the moment. Mm. Now, with the rise of digital gambling, with the ease of your phone, mm has -hmm. created bigger problems in regard to problem gambling? So phones help people who have problems get deeper into their problems. So what I advocate for is something, I advocate two things. The first to inject some frictions back in the system is not NOT, not to outlaw gambling or outlaw phone betting and things like that. But instead, what some countries have done is first, they've outlawed the ability to use a credit card when using online gambling. So I can't pre-fund my phone with my credit card. A number of countries have done this. Great Britain is probably the best case where they looked around and they said, you know, we have people who are betting and going into debt with their credit card company. So in Great Britain, been outlawed. Australia has proposed this legislation, hasn't enacted it yet. Ireland, it's voluntary, but the group of gambling, uh, the people who accept bets, have said, we're not going to accept credit cards. It's outlawed in Germany. Here in the United States, I'm in the state of Massachusetts, you can't use a credit card. So all of those states and countries, they say, if you want to use your phone, what you have to do is you have to use a debit card. So that introduces a little bit of friction into the system. I can't overextend myself by saying, oh, I have a $5,000 limit on my credit card. Let me bet with that. And before I go on to my second point, let me just talk a little bit about why you don't want to be betting with your credit card. Because often, not always, but often when you make a bet on your credit card, the credit card company treats that as a cash advance. And if you ever look carefully at your credit card statement, your credit card statement will probably have two different interest rates down the very bottom of the statement. A lower interest rate for purchases and a higher interest rate for cash advances. I need some money out. So you're paying a much higher rate when you're betting with a credit card. And second, for many people, they're like, oh, I pay off my credit card all in full every month. I don't have to pay any interest. But for most credit card companies, cash advances 
instantly start that debt, instantly start that interest going. So even if you pay off your credit card bill in full every single month, when you bet on your phone, you're probably going to be paying interest. And those interest rates on an annual basis are huge. For many cash advances, they're over 20%. So that means for every dollar you're betting, 20 cents of it is going to go to interest, which is huge, bigger, huge. How far are we to see to seeing this really all play out? Uh, legalized uh, gambling in many states now. Uh, maybe people are going in debt with credit cards if they're doing the cash advance. Is it playing out a little bit already uh, where we're seeing problems surface that weren't there two years ago? You know, I don't know. You had on your show a couple of uh, episodes ago a person from UNLV, a PhD student who was looking at this kind of data. Um, and I still have not gotten access to the credit card data to see how many people here in the United States are betting using their credit cards. Um, so one of the problems is that we've only had about two years worth of data, two years worth of information on online gambling and the problems. So we haven't fully seen all the issues come out yet. But I think if I'm coming back on your show in four or five years, We'll have a much better handle on the actual size of this problem. Uh, Jay, I'm glad you brought it up. It was with uh, CASRA at UNLV. And what they're doing is interesting research. So they're using data uh, from payment providers. Now, let's just pretend for a moment that all gamblers were using their uh, cashless uh, way to play. Um, with the data and predictive analytics, they're getting closer to identifying where problems might exist in flagging those guests. If you could respond to that. So with predictive analytics, we can flag those guests who are probably gonna get into trouble using their credit cards. The problem with this is that credit card companies have a built-in incentive not to flag people. Why? Because they're going to be earning large amounts of interest, and these are very profitable com customers for the credit card companies. So whenever you have it in your own interest, and then to self-police yourself to do something that will not benefit yourself, I find it very hard to believe that credit card companies will jump in whole hog and say, you know, this is a societal problem, and even though this will cost us billions of dollars in profits, we're gonna do it because it's the right thing. As a business school professor, I strongly believe in capitalism and in businesses. But as a business school professor, I see that capitalism has its downsides because businesses are driven by their desire to make maximum profits. In some ways, so, we have to protect businesses from themselves as well as protecting gamblers from themselves. So what is the middle ground? Gambling's not going away. Cashless gambling is on the rise. Mm -hmm. You're stating that it's good to have some pain points or some friction, in fact, uh, if that means the consumer or the gambler is having to use cash, which is kind of going away in regard to gambling. What is the middle ground? Well, I'd like to advocate not for the middle ground, but for the extreme, because I've always found that arguing for the extreme points in the spectrum gets my point across. As I said before, a number of states and countries have banned the ability to use credit cards. If I had some control over the situation and I can only make recommendations, I would say we should go back to the system where all bets have to be made in cash and cash only. And if you'd like to use your phone, no problem. Pre-fund it with cash. So it'd be a little kiosk. Uh, for example, uh, I spent some time in London and there were little bookmaking joints scattered on you know, street corners. If I wanted to use that local bookmaker joints uh, online app, I would have to walk over, hand the bookie behind the counter some cash. They would type in my account number or I'd scan my account number and they'd pre-fund. And whenever the cash was gone, 
I would have to physically bring cash in again. Mm -hmm. Now, bookmakers are saying, whoa, 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 we don't want this. We don't want a lot of cash. That makes our business potentially dangerous. We get held up. We can do all these kind of things. But the goal is by adding friction to what we'll call sin purchases, we can reduce these kind of things, not for everybody, but for some. And I'll stop in one second and why? Because by using cash, you inject a, a little bit of pain, a little bit of mental, ooh, what am I doing here? I'm pulling off a lot of bills and giving people a moment to think about something that as society, we'd like to say, sure, it's okay to do it, but think just a moment before you do. Is there an example, you cited uh, England, is there another example that is getting closer to uh, creating more friction, uh, more pain um, in this model? I don't think there are a lot of friction models, but we can go back just a few years ago. Um, a few years ago, if you went to the racetrack here in the United States, all right, and you wanted to place a bet, you stood in line, you know, there were like 10 minutes to post time, for example, you had to stand in line and put cash down on the counter. I could not stand in line, at least here in Massachusetts, at the local horse track or the dog track, and I could not pull out my credit card and say, you know, give me $100. Hmm. I needed that $100. When I went to the track, I needed to get the amount of cash that I was going to gamble. And by doing that, it set a budget. And I can't tell you, uh, let, let me say that I do not gamble very much. I gamble occasionally. Uh, but when I would go to the horse track or the dog track, I would see people walk out after the second or third race. You know, they spent all their money. And they'd be yelling and screaming and talking to themselves and things like that. But they had a budget. They had a set amount of cash. And they could not keep going. They had to wait another day to come back. Or at least they had to drive to the bank and then come back into the, through the turnstiles again. So once again, this idea of friction slows things down and puts limits because you don't want people in a situation like gambling to have no limits. That's when big problems derive. What has the response been uh, in general? Uh, can you share both sides? Uh, some that are advocating, same when they hear your presentation about cash and advocating for cash, that they're all for it. But then you you must get some criticism too. Can you share both sides? Well, I think that the simple criticism is that I'm a dinosaur because I advocate for using cash in multiple situations. And I advocate that individuals use cash for many reasons uh, besides control over gambling. But since this show is about responsible gambling, let me just focus on this. Here in the United States, we're seeing a gradual loosening of many prohibitions. When I was young here in Massachusetts, you couldn't gamble. Here in Massachusetts, you couldn't smoke marijuana. Those were all illegal. Uh, and for other things, um, there's also been some loosening, not in Massachusetts, but in surrounding states, you couldn't light off fireworks. So those were three things that when I was young were just totally verboten. You know, police would come by, they'd arrest you for selling fireworks or lighting off fireworks, for smoking marijuana. You could get hauled into the station. Uh, and for gambling, you had to deal with um, illegal bookmakers. Today in Massachusetts, uh, there's three marijuana dispensaries within a five minute walk of my home uh, and a couple more within a few blocks of where I teach. So it's legal to buy marijuana and they they do an incredible amount of advertising. I can bet on sports. I don't have to do anything illegal. Uh, and Massachusetts is the only state out of the 50 states in the here in the US that does not allow some form of fireworks. 49 other states allow fireworks. So there's been a gradual loosening of many controls in society. Uh, let me say on the opposite, there's been some tightening uh, everyone would smoke when I was young, and today smoking has been almost taxed out of existence here in Massachusetts. The tax rates are extremely high. So for many things, it's been loosening. For a few things, it's been tightening. Because we have all these things that society many years ago thought was bad, smoking marijuana, 
lighting off fireworks, gambling, that are now society says, it's okay, as long as we tax them and you do them legally, we're going to allow it. We should do all of these things in cash because we'd like to put in frictions for all of these types of things. So what I'm advocating is pretty much anything that was considered a, you know, illegal or sin type of activity back, say, 50 years ago should be done in cash for a simple reason. It slows things down, reduces the profits, and causes people to think just for a moment. I'm mm -hmm. not saying people should not be allowed to smoke marijuana. I believe uh, they should. I should not say that they should not be allowed to light off fireworks. I think people should. I think people should be allowed to gamble too. But once again, we want people to say, hey, let me have some limits here. Because we as humans have self-control issues. We all do. I don't know about you, Philip, but whenever I see a piece of chocolate cake, mm -hmm. especially one oozing, oozing, you know, with all kind of frosting on the top, I mean, I just, I can't control myself. You know, a waitress comes by and says, oh, we have fresh chocolate cake for dessert, sir, what do you want? And I'm like, two pieces. And I'll admit, Philip, I've actually ordered dessert before my main course at numerous restaurants. I've done the same, especially uh, in Japan when I have matcha, which is uh, one of my weakness, weaknesses. Uh, anything matcha. Uh, on that uh, Japan's a country that um, often you have to use cash. Why do you think they have, in general, uh, is a culture, uh, kind of preserve the use of cash, where much of the world has gone to cashless? I'll be honest, Philip. I've been thinking about this for the last couple of years. There are many societies that have gone completely cashless. Sweden is an example. So, um, the Swedish government actually had to pass laws telling banks, banks, not stores, but banks, that they had to provide cash and allow cash services, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, China, almost an entirely cashless society right now. There are a number of other countries, as you said, Japan, a very cash intensive society. Uh, Germany, also a very cash intensive society. Um, and it's very hard to really understand. We'll focus on Germany for a moment. Uh, there are many other countries like France, which shares a common border with Germany, which is much more cashless. So how two countries almost physically or actually physically side by side, one can be sort of a much more cashless society, one can be a cash society. It's a little hard to understand. And I do not, unfortunately, have a great explanation for why some societies are still cashless, uh, sorry, still cash intensive and others are cashless. And some, like here in the United States, are moving between the two. But, and I'm not against using credit cards. Uh, if I happen to open my wallet right now, you will see I still have two credit cards in my wallet. But I do try and advocate people to use cash for a number of very simple reasons. Uh, one reason is the self-control issue. When you use cash, there's something called the pain of paying. Pain of paying. You pull out. $50, you put it down on the counter, and for a moment, there's a tiny bit of regret. When you swipe your credit card, when you tap you know, your phone, or you use near field recognition, when you walk sort of by with your phone on something, and it goes, boop, there's no pain. The pain shows up three weeks, a month later, when it's time to pay that bill. Because of that, there's less self-control. And this idea of adding friction, adding self-control is an important reason for using cash in society and for getting people to be responsible, more responsible gamblers. How do your students respond to this point of view? <laughs> Most of them chuckle. And when I ask for a show of hands, almost no one has any cash on them. Um, I often do demonstrations where I need to use a little bit of cash. So I'm saying, does anyone have any money? You know, and I say, does anyone have, for example, a $20 bill, which is pretty common here in the United States because it is the most popular bill given out by ATM machines. So if you use an ATM, you're probably going to get at least a 20. And I, there are a number of times where I have to pull the 20 out of my own wallet and then go on with the demonstration because sitting in a room of 40 or 50 people, people are like, we don't have any cash. 
And then I explain some reasons why. And many people say, ah, okay, I understand reasons for using cash. And then I ask the next class, all right, did anyone get cash? And almost no one's in there. And they all believe me on sort of a conceptual level, but no one actually goes out and actually starts using cash. You know, uh, this has been great. I mean, in the gaming industry, uh, there's a big push to go even further into cashless. Um, it's, it's momentum that's not slowing down, and there's a lot of good coming out of it. But I think it's so important to hear this point of view that creating some friction, some pain around paying, um, there is some value to this. Any final thoughts before we say farewell? No, I don't think so. But in general, if you'd like to have a little bit more savings, if you'd like to sort of, I, I, you know, there's actually even been some research that says people who pay with cash lose a little bit of weight, right? They eat healthier, right? I mean, there's only one paper and I'm not sure it's been replicated. I haven't found a replication yet. But if you want to do, you know, things that improve your bank account, cut back on the things you know you shouldn't be doing, use cash. Maybe that's where we tie back into uh, Japan, where there's very little obesity, and they do pretty much almost everything is paid uh, with cash when you compare it to other uh, countries like the U.S., which has a lot more obesity. So maybe there's uh, some connection there. So, and Philip, for those people who are watching at this point, we're thinking, man, this guy's a dinosaur. You know, he's just not really up there. Um, modern technology, people talk about being on the cutting edge. And the problem with modern technology is sometimes being on the cutting edge cuts you. Well said. Uh, Jay, thank you. Thank you for your time today. Pleasure being on your show, Philip. Thanks for listening to the No Line Podcast, hosted by Philip Beer. For a complete list of past episodes, visit iTunes or www.nolinepodcast.com. That's www.nolinepodcast.com. Interested in being a guest on the No Line Podcast or sharing your organization's responsible gaming story? Send an email to philip at nolinemedia.com. The No Line Podcast is committed to responsible gaming. Responsible gaming. gaming. The No Line Podcast is a Philip James Media Production.